Good morning, class. It's good to be back with you again, studying the book of Philippians here. Uh, hopefully you had a good week, warmed up some this week. That always makes things go better. Uh, also, it looks like we're seeing some encouraging signs for the virus, so I'm glad for that. Uh, I don't think anybody wants this to go on any longer than it has to, so... Uh, hopefully you've been able to reach out to uh, those that are shut in or isolated, those who uh, have needs. Um, there's been people in the hospital, there's been people grieving in our congregation. Um, it's just important to be there for one another. Uh, it's part of the fellowship we've been talking about. You, Fellowship with the good and, and with the bad in life. And um, they're both equally important and they both help build up a family relationship. So uh, continue to do that. Uh, continue to pray for the healthcare workers. They still have a very hard job uh, and a hard schedule. So they've been through a lot more than a lot of us have during this time. Um, so we will start this morning with a word of prayer. Dear Lord, it's just a privilege and an honor to come before you. Lord, we just praise you for your greatness. We praise you for your healing hand. We praise you for your love and compassion. We praise you for your mercy. Lord, you are all-powerful, you are all-knowing. Uh, just help us be mindful of that. Pray that you continue to help us to look to you to uh, guide and direct us through your word and, and your spirit. I ask that you will continue to show us uh, opportunities that we can be a good servant of yours. Help us, Lord, to be a good steward of what you've given to us. And Lord, I just pray that you continue to be with those in our church and our family that uh, has has different needs, Lord, and pray that in all things you will be glorified. Pray that we, we will be your hands and feet here, Lord. We ask that your kingdom come, that it grows here on earth, and that your will will be done. And we ask and pray this in your son's name. Amen. All right, uh, we finished uh, chapter 3 last week, and I want to go over the, just the last two verses a little bit. Uh, again, very encouraging verses. Uh, verse 20, chapter 3, verse 20 says, For our citizenship is in heaven, for which also we eagerly await for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And... Uh, we talked about that last week, how uh, we live here, but our citizenship is in heaven. And by that right, we should act like we are citizens of heaven. Uh, we should live our life like we are citizens of heaven. And, uh, and of course, Paul was speaking about against those who had earthly views and their eyes were on things of the earth. And our eyes should be on things of heaven. Our eyes should be on things that, in God's kingdom, His church here on earth, and uh, the needs that are there, uh, because our citizenship is in heaven. In verse 21, says, uh, I talk about Jesus Christ, says, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of His glory by the exertion of the power that He has even to subject all things to himself. And we talked last week how um, he transforms our body. Those of us, or those who are still living on earth when Jesus comes back, their body is going to be changed uh, when he comes. And it will be a glorified state like the body that Jesus has now. Uh, of course, those who have passed on when he comes back, will re be resurrected from the dead and will receive their glorified bodies. So, and so we know he can do that. How? Uh, because he's already showed us a power he has to 
subject all things to himself. So we don't have to worry about him not being able to fulfill his promises. He can subject all things to himself. So those are encouraging things. Our citizenship isn't here. When Christ is going to give us a glorified body someday. In uh, verse uh, 1 of chapter 4 starts out, therefore. So that's what Paul's talking about, therefore. Because of these things. Uh, therefore, my beloved brethren, whom I long to see, my joy, my crown, so stand firm in the Lord, my beloved. So um, he calls him my beloved brother. Uh, this is one of several occasions in this letter that he addressed them as such. Uh, he calls them my joy and my crown. Uh, you know, he's done this in other places in the First Thessalonians. He talks about the Christians at Thessalonica in the same way. And uh, in First Thessalonians 2, 19 and 20, he says, What is our hope and joy and crown of rejoicing? Are not you in the presence of Jesus Christ at his coming? You are our glory and our joy. So Paul counted the people that he was able to teach, that he was able to share the gospel with, who became Christians, he counts them as his joy and his crown. And uh, so he's talking to the Philippian people the same way, that... Uh, that they are his joy and crown. And here in the uh, very last phrase of verse 1 is the first exhortation. And that's what chapter 4 is here in the first 10 verses, is a series of exhortations. He's encouraging them to do different things. And we're going to see there's about a dozen of them actually. But the first one is stand firm in the Lord, okay? Remain steadfast. That's what Paul wants for the people at Philippi. Stand firm in the Lord. And that's certainly what God wants for us to. Uh, it talks about some people are uh, tossed here and fro like the wind blows weeds. Uh, we shouldn't be that way. Uh, we have a firm foundation. We have a rock to stand on. We should be able to take some of the stuff that comes our way, whether it's false teaching, whether it's the trials of life, we should be able to take some of these things and stand firm. And that's what Paul's encouraging them to do. Now, the second verse here is, is kind of an interesting thing. And he is doing these exhortations. He's encouraging them to do things. And here in verse 2, he's talking about two women. And he calls them out by name. And he tells them to live in harmony. Now, we don't know much about these women except what we see right here in these two verses, 2 and 3. But um, at the time of him writing here, the Philippian letter, and at, for at least for some time, both of these women have been uh, members of the church there at Philippi. And if you look in Acts 16, it shows you what a large part women in general did for the church at Philippi when Paul was there and when he established it. Uh, now, when the church was founded and maybe at a later visit with Paul to Philippi, these women had been fellow workers with Paul and had worked together and, and were faithful to Paul and his companions. But somewhere along the way, they come up, there was a disagreement between these ladies. And it had affected the church in a negative way. And Paul calls them out here by name. You can imagine, Paul's writing this letter. The church is, is being read in the public. And Paul calls these two ladies out by name. Uh, so he was definitely uh, worried about it. He was definitely concerned about it. Uh, he wanted them to, to get over this disagreement they had. So uh, he says, I, uh, I urge uh, Yodia and I urge Sentichi. Okay, that's the two ladies, Eurodia and Sentichi. Uh, not very common names for us nowadays, but uh, to live in harmony. 
All right. So he, he wanted them to be of the same mind. That's what harmony, this word for Greek in harmony means. Be of the same mind. Uh, they both need to end this strained relations that they have. Both of them. So he calls out, I urge uh, Yodia and I urge Sentity. So he's, he treats them the same. It's not one over the other. He treats them both the same. Live in harmony. And so now in verse 3, he, he calls out a third person, and he doesn't name it who it is. Now there's speculation, but it's purely speculation as to who he's talking to. But in verse 3 he says, <clears throat> Indeed, true comrade, I ask you to help these women who have shared my struggle in the cause of the gospel, together with Clement also and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. So, true comrade, he's calling out someone, and obviously they knew who it was. Uh, we, don't really, we don't really know who it was to help these women. You know, a lot of times when there is a conflict between two parties in the church, Sometimes it's hard for either one of them to take the initiative to fix it. And sometimes it's really uh, an advantage to have a third person step in and be a peacekeeper. All right. And, uh, and he, Paul's telling this person he wants them to do that. And he said that these ladies have shared my struggle in the cause of the gospel. So in the past, they have both supported Paul. Not only Paul, but also uh, Clement and also the rest of my fellow workers. So these women have helped numerous people uh, in the history of the church here at Philippi. But somewhere along the line, something came up and there was not harmony anymore. And Paul was trying to get this straightened out. Now, he didn't name the rest of my fellow workers. Uh, he only called out one name, Clement. Uh, the rest he did not call out, but he says, whose names are in the book of life, okay? Uh, so their names are recorded, even though he didn't record it here in the letter, they are recorded. You know, in ancient cities, they maintained a register of the cities. And uh, so, in the same way, there's a list of names uh, for the citizens of heaven, and it's called the Book of Life. Uh, it's talked about in Luke 10, uh, Hebrews 12, Revelation, <laughs> lots of places, thir chapter 13, chapter 17, chapter 20, 21, 22, all talk about the Book of Life. When a Christian, a person becomes a Christian, their name is added to the Book of Life. Now, if a man or a person becomes unfaithful, Scripture warns that such a person's name can be blotted out of the book. Uh, Revelation 3, verse 5 says that. And also Exodus 32 uh, talked about that. So, but if a man is faithful unto death, his name is forever fixed in the book of life. And uh, that is the theme that uh, we've, we've seen in the book of Revelation that he who is faithful unto death shall receive the crown of righteousness. So, so living a faithful life, habitual, continual, uh, until death is part of our salvation process. It's just glorifying God and serving Him all the way through and not losing that faith, not rejecting His Spirit. You know, that, that is the unpardonable sin, blasphemy or rejection of his spirit. So, so the, it's important that a person continues to be faithful unto death uh, so that their name is not taken out of the book of life. So now another exhortation here. We're ready for verse 4. And he's telling them he wants them to cultivate these positive Christian virtues. And he's going to list three of them here. And these virtues produce the peace of God. So, 
The first one, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. That is a Christian virtue that we should have and we can cultivate it. We can be better at it by working at it. Um, it's so important that no matter what goes on, no matter how dark or dreary your present circumstances are, in the Lord, a Christian can always find something to rejoice about. And, uh, you know, I, I, I think we really need this verse today in our church, in our family, in our time. There's so much bad news, <laughs> so much bickering, so much complaining about whether it's uh, things related to the virus and restrictions or um, political stuff that goes on. Uh, we see so much uh, hate and antagonism in the social media and, and just throughout our lives. And as Christians, we need to remember that we're not supposed to be part of that. We need to rejoice in the Lord always. And Paul says, and again I say rejoice. And so th there's a big thing we can work on this week. <laughs> uh, we could just stop right there, but, but we're not going to, but we could. But uh, rejoice in the Lord always. Now, um, Paul has used the word rejoice at least ten times in the book of Philippians. So that, that has been a theme here. Uh, we've already studied that he rejoiced that the gospel was being preached in chapter 1. Uh, he looked forward to the Philippians rejoicing when he saw them again. Um, he expected to rejoice at Christ's coming um, because he would see the results of all his work. Uh, and if his life was sacrificed in the course of his service, remember, he would rejoice at that. And he called on the Philippians to rejoice with him. Remember we talked about that. Uh, he sent Aphrodite uh, to bring rejoicing to the brethren. And he called his fellow Christians to rejoice in the Lord, for this is one of the marks of the people of God. So this idea of rejoicing always is a theme of this book. And Paul's encouraging them to cultivate this positive Christian virtue of rejoicing always. So that's what we need to do, uh, cultivate that. Now verse 5, uh, he talks about, let your forbearing spirit be known to all men. Here's another thing that we need to cultivate, a forbearing spirit. Uh, now, forbearing in the Greek here is a hard word to find in English equivalent. Uh, it means a readiness to listen to reason, okay? A willingness to yield one's personal rights for another's benefits. It's being kind Hearted. It's having a beautiful disposition, okay? So we need to cultivate that forbearing spirit. Why? And so it'll be known to all men. People are watching Christians how we live. And we need to show them, one, that we can rejoice always, and two, that we have this kind, loving spirit about us, and they can see it. Uh, and it's one less thing that, the world would have to uh, belittle Christians about. So he finishes that verse there. The Lord is near. Okay, the Lord's a reference to Jesus. Uh, and it's a statement that says, The Lord is close beside us, watching us. Okay, you know, it's much like what Jesus said in Matthew 28 20. He said, Lo, I'm with you always. Uh, Jesus is always near us. And so we need to remember that. Now, verse 6, another one here that we should cultivate. Something we might not have as much now, but we can be better at it. We can cultivate this. We can grow this. And he says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Be anxious for nothing. In the Greek, it says, stop being anxious about anything. 
It's almost a repetition of Jesus' command on the Sermon on the Mount in the fifth or the sixth chapter of Matthew. And also Martha in Luke 10 is an example of such anxiety. Remember how she was so anxious about getting everything ready and Mary was just sitting at Jesus' feet. And so we shouldn't be anxious. Uh, now he goes on here, everything in prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be known to God. Um, Oren Root, he wrote for the Standard Lesson Commentary. He, he said this about this verse. He says, we pray to our Father. Uh, we tell Him all about our needs. We don't forget to thank Him for what He has already done for us. And that's it. It's, we don't want to be anxious. We want to turn that over to the Lord. And it's by uh, prayer and supplication. Prayer is a uh, prayer to obtain good. Supplication is a prayer to avoid evil. That's the differentiation there in the Greek terms for prayer and supp supplication. And But in our prayer and our supplication about the stuff that causes us anxiety, he says what? With thanksgiving. And um, if you've been paying attention when Bobby Warren uh, teaches uh, about communion, the word for thanksgiving is Eucharistus, okay, which is a word that's used to describe the communion. Uh, and he's done a couple of the examples uh, or communion meditations on that over the years. And so it's, it's an idea of being grateful, okay, and we should acknowledge our past favors and we should have a firm, firmly grounded assurance of the future. Hayden said, to pray in any other spirit is to clip the wings of prayer. So don't be anxious. Give it to God through prayer and supplication, but with thanksgiving. That's the key. Remember what God has done for us. Be thankful for that. Uh, be thankful that we can have assurance that he'll continue to be with us. And finish this verse, it said, uh, and everything, let your request be made known to God. And uh, the Greek for request is, is this idea that we're talking to God face to face, okay? That we can ask Him for a definite, specific uh, object or need or anything, really. And uh, we let our request be known to God face to face. So... You know, now, I'm not saying, and I don't think Paul's saying that in everything we have to be thankful. Uh, when you lose a loved one, you lose your job, a house, whatever, uh, there's times we're not thankful for those things. Uh, we're not thankful for the, the evil things that the devil uh, bestows upon us. But in everything, no matter what happens in our lives, we can find things to be thankful for. And we can always pray, pray to God and tell Him our issues, but we should always have that, that heart of thankfulness. Because in the end, all the things that really matter are still true, aren't they? Uh, God has provided us the opportunity, the means for salvation. Those things never change. And no matter how many bad things happen, those things, God's plan of salvation for us never changes. So we, uh, if we weigh these things out, all the things that really matter are still there. So even when these terrible things happen in life, we still have a lot to be thankful for. And that's really the attitude that, that Paul is looking at here. <clears throat> Excuse me. So now, verse uh, 7 and the peace of God, okay? So if we cultivate these things, the peace of God uh, will be produced in us. And it says, the peace of God which surpasses all comprehension. It's more than, than we can really grasp. Uh, it's unfathomable, the peace of God. But what will the peace of God do? It will guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. So... Again, uh, this guarding is a military term. And remember, 
Philippi is a military uh, city. There was uh, soldiers stationed there. Uh, they would be used to seeing soldiers stand guard. And uh, so Paul uses this term. And the peace of God guards what? It guards our hearts and our minds. Now, the difference here is, in this case, our hearts, speaking of our emotions, like fear and apprehension, and our minds would speak to the intellectual side of man. So, so in Christ, the peace of God shall guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Being in Christ, that means we're Christians. Paul's speaking to Christians, and Christians have this promise that the peace of God will guard our hearts and our minds. Um, so another privilege of being in the family of God. So now, verse 8 uh, and 9, and this talks about the... Uh, He's exhorting them to have proper meditation and uh, proper actions. And uh, so the verb of this verse is the very last clause in, chapter, in uh, verse 9. And it is, let your mind dwell on these things. So he's going to list eight things here that we should let our minds dwell on. So write these down. You can work on one every day and two someday <laughs> before we get back. But uh, um, he starts off here, verse 8. Uh, finally, brethren, okay, uh, he's done with his, uh, these exhortations. And after these verses, so he says, finally, brethren, and remember, it's let your mind dwell on these things. And the first thing he says that our mind should dwell on, whatever is true, okay? Whatever is true. Now, whatever God has said is true. Romans 3, 4 tells us that. Jesus says, I am the truth in John 14, 6. So we should meditate, we should think, on those things that are true, that are valid, reliable, okay, um, the opposite of false. And God is one of those things. Jesus is one of those things. So now the second thing, what it, set your minds on whatever is honorable, okay? Again, this is a difficult word to translate in the English. Uh, it really carries the idea of worthy of reverence, okay? And again, uh, we know who fills those bills. Uh, same people that are true, uh, God himself, the Father, and Jesus the Son are true and honorable. These are the things we should uh, let your mind dwell on these things. Now, the next, whatever is right, uh, whatever is right in God's eyes, and you could put the word righteous in there. Whatever is righteous in God's um, view, God's word and his spirit has set what is morally right or righteous, what is uh, righteous for us to do, to think, and we should set our minds on these things. Next, what is pure, okay? What is undefiled? The world's full of things that are sordid and soiled and defiled. And we need to think on the things that are pure. And don't let these uh, sordid thoughts harbor in our mind and stay in our minds. Whatever is lovely, okay? This word uh, only occurs right here in the New Testament, the only time. And it's what's pleasing, agreeable, or attractive, okay? That's what we should think about. Whatever is of good repute, um, this is forms from two words in the Greek. The first word means one. Uh, the first word means to speak, and the other means well. 
So whatever is well spoken of uh, in, in the mind of the Christians, there will only be words which are fit for God to hear that are well spoken or to speak well. Now he finishes up here, he says, if there is, okay, and it's sort of like he, he kind of groups anything he might have left out, really. If there is any excellence, okay, anything uh, that's morally, spiritually, or spiritually excellent is a matter that's worthy for Christians to uh, ponder or to set your mind on. Anything that's excellent, anything that's worthy of praise, okay, now, this could be, we set our minds on things that are worthy of praise from God, also that are worthy of praise from men. Uh, because if we do good things and men see it, they then can praise and give glory to God because of our actions. So, you know, the Christian can control what goes through his mind. Uh, you know, Solomon, way a long time ago in Proverbs 23, he said, As he thinks in his heart, so is he. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So we need to be careful what we ponder on. And Paul has given us these things that we should. So it also reminds us of Romans 12, 2, and it says, Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. How do you do that? You ponder on the things that are good and lovely and righteous, okay? A true, honorable. Now, the author wrote a thing here, and I'm going to do it here, or read it because I, I think uh, it, it was well done. It says, Perhaps an illustration from the world of music will help. The pitch for a piano tuner is taken from a tuning fork. The tuning fork... For the Christian is whatever rings true, judged by the biblical standard of morality and judged by God's righteousness itself. He said there are ever new and changing questions that have to be tested by the Christian's spiritual tuning fork. Just as a piano must be kept in tune, so must our sensitive spiritual natures be kept clean and sweet. Uh, so I agree wholeheartedly with that. I think that's what Paul's telling them. Put your mind, let your mind dwell on these things. Make sure that what we think, what we do is in tune with God's righteousness. And uh, so there's about a dozen things or more right there we can work on this week. So uh, I really have come to appreciate Paul more and more as we study his letters. He, he, verse after verse after verse, he's just challenging the people to live a better life, to be uh, more godlike, more righteous, and in the same way uh, God has preserved it for us so that we can be more godlike, more righteous. So, Lord willing, I'll see you next week. Take care.